Hi, I'm Terry Kyle, the co-founder of WPX.net, and joining me today is a relatively new customer at WPX, Mark Borum, and he is the co-founder of a SaaS company, and Mark is going to tell us all about that and the 500 plus users that his platform has. So Mark, welcome, and it's good afternoon where I am. I'm not exactly sure of what your time zone is there at the moment. You've got me at 9 a.m. On a, on a Wednesday morning here in New York. Nice, beautiful. Mark, can you please give us a quick biography of your life and what led up to this point now? Yeah, so uh, interestingly enough, um, I was never meant to be an entrepreneur. You know, I, I tell people I'm an accidental entrepreneur, uh, probably the best decision I ever made in my life. But I started out, I moved to New York to be an actor and um, I'd stayed in school. I got a little bit nervous and this kind of ties into where I try to coach people into taking entrepreneurship seriously. I stayed in school and got my master's. Um, I had gone to school for theater and then I decided, okay, I'm going to stay back here and get my MBA because it's safe in case this doesn't work out as an actor, like just not really taking the plunge. Um, but during that time I went and sold books door to door. Uh, and I did that specifically so I could get used to hearing no. So I moved to New York. Um, Heard no a lot and then was able to scrape together enough jobs as an actor to call myself an actor. Um, so for five years, I <clears throat> performed all over the globe um, and I was doing theater. I'm a, a song and dance man by, by nature. Um, but I was on the road and I was doing Rent. I was actually playing the lead in Rent at the time. And my brother, who is uh, my, my mother's favorite son, he's the tall six foot four you know, Stanford Wharton graduate. He's like, all the things that you would, you, on paper is perfect. Um, he reached out to me and was like, hey, I need you to help me get an idea I have off the ground. And I was like, no. <laughs> and he, he just said to me, he's like, well, okay, fine. And he went on about his business. And, and I just started to think about it. I was like, well, Pete's a lot smarter than I am. So maybe he's onto something. Um, and he was looking to try to do something in the, um, the YouTube space specifically. Uh, this is this is 2012, okay. and um, I was just like, okay, you know what? Let me just see what he's thinking about. And he told me, you know, you can do your show at night because the shows are on evening schedule. Help me get this off the ground during the day. Just help me get it going. Um, and I didn't really think of myself as an entrepreneur. I was doing that. The show closed as they do. Uh, we got a few successes, a few small clients started to hire against those successes and then started to get some money and, and I just kept plugging away. And so that led us from, you know, the, not being an entrepreneur to starting a tech company uh, to taking that to an acquisition. And now I, I have another company called Talent Sheets, uh, which is kind of a spinoff of that. And I can dig into that as well as, as is helpful uh, as well as a blog where uh, called 30 Days to 100K, where I talk about entrepreneurship and people who are uh, going and pursuing their dreams. Terrific. Uh, and my take there very quickly, Mark, uh, though it's not widely known about me, I'm actually a qualified drama teacher. So yeah, get out of here. I love that. Yeah. Uh, English and drama and I have taught in Australia and the UK in those as well and actually I view that entrepreneurship because I've kind of been doing it I'm I'm a bit of the opposite I'm the natural sort of creative business building entrepreneur and sort of have been since I was a kid but I think uh, like drama it's just all about taking something from your imagination and making it real yeah and that's all it is so for me, I just view all of these things like for you, talent sheets and other projects, or for me, a dog shelter or movies or WPX. I kind of view them all as part of exactly the same creative spectrum, but it's and a lot of the, the process and approach will be exactly the same. But ultimately, it just simply comes down to imagining a better way or a different way of doing something and then yep. executing yep. it in the real world. Uh, and to me, that's entrepreneurship. Uh, and for me, actually, it has very little or nothing to do with money. And it's all about this process of creation and just building things where there was nothing before. Yeah, it's super exciting to treat them. And I, and I love that you said that because, um, you know, when we were going out to raise money from our first venture 
um, like round, I had shied away from the fact that I had been an actor, right? Because when you're going out to try and get VC firms to like look at you in any capacity, then if you're an actor, then you better be Leonardo DiCaprio or Ashton Kutcher because then it's like, okay, you're an actor who is into tech and into like, and you have some clout. And to be a stage actor in New York, there everybody was just like, who is this? But what I found is that I'd go to these different meetings and I have all these conversations with these different entrepreneurs and selling our organization into other organizations. And I'd say 60% of the time, and this is not an exaggeration, there was somebody in the room who had a background in the arts in some capacity. And I think it, you know, it really spoke to the industry that we're in and the, and the successes that were possible on these companies. I think it was really fantastic. I love that. Yeah. And I think also, because I've had a, a, an extremely brief, uh, spectacularly failed career as an actor back in Australia. And I think for me, uh, if you are an actor, a creative, it's great if you've got that initiative to produce your own projects. So you yep. could involve, you could be the writer as well as the producer, possibly actor, director, writer, director, or whatever. And then you're kind of not this sort of passive person waiting for somebody else, a gatekeeper to give you a green light. You just initiate the project yourself. Yeah, 100%. Well, it's, it's interesting because that is, that um, is, I think the biggest takeaway from this for me and the biggest reason that I kind of, try to push as many people as possible into entrepreneurship and i don't an entrepreneurship doesn't mean you have to go and like throw away everything that you have and quit your job and and start today and like say i'm going to go all in and i'm going to build my business in the, in the garage and it has to be a billion dollar company it's it's you know entrepreneurship is starting something that allows you to have a lot more control over your destiny um and that was the biggest thing for me because when i was acting i had a lot of friends who would go the typical route and I didn't create as much, but I did learn a lot from sales and doing, you know, door to door sales. And, and I was always reaching out to people and always trying to get feedback and always trying to put myself in the room, um, which is not what you're supposed to do. And it gave me a lot more opportunity that, than I would have had otherwise. I, I think I was a lot more successful than my talent deserved. Uh, and so it, it ended up, it, I, I love that though, because the, the, the core kind of message that I'm taking away is like, you're, you have an opportunity to control what your outcome is going to be as long as you're going and you're creating something yourself. Yeah. And I think that's ultimately what makes us happy is when we have control over our time, the options, how we choose to spend our time, who we spend Absolutely. it with, the environments that we're in. Uh, and actually, you could have, we could actually have WPX as a much smaller operation. We employ about 100 people here uh, and we'd be perfectly happy with that. Uh, it really depends on exactly uh, what you want. Uh, and if you've got clarity on that, that can, that can make a huge difference. I well, think the other thing, next Mark, question, my, my, my assumption is that of those 100 people, probably 70 of them are customer service because I, I joined, I, I don't know what the numbers are, but I joined uh, WPX high. I think about six months ago. And I have spoken with a customer service rep no less than eight or nine times and every single time instantaneous responses and this is not a plug for you just because i mean it is a plug for you but not because i have to i think uh wpx is fantastic your customer service is top notch it is my favorite customer service online and i don't say that as hyperbole legitimately it's, it's phenomenal so i i think 100 or 150 or 1500 or 15,000 it doesn't matter like you're doing a great job on what you have with what you have i love it yeah, and I think two key things that we uh, settled on because we're a fully independent bootstrapped company. So no outside VC money. We don't have VC, some yeah. dark corporate overlord at all that we have to answer to. And actually, well, that's really important to us. Uh, and it's also important to our customers like you because you value your independence and you want more control over your time and your life. So it's a nice fit there. But a couple of things we... Uh, identified as being very important a while back. One was speed of response. So we've been averaging under 30 seconds for many years now. That's independently verifiable with our live chat provider, Live Chat Inc. And wow. the other is that it always struck me as very weird in web hosting because I used web hosting companies for maybe 20 years before starting up WPX with my Bulgarian business partner. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a very weird, unique thing in web hosting where 
if something went wrong with your website and your hosting, they would just send you an article and you had to now read this long, difficult technical article, figure out which bit applied to your particular problem and then apply it. So really? if you're like an acting guy or a travel blogger or a surfing blogger or whatever, all this stuff is like Chinese to you. And wouldn't yep. it be better instead if we just stepped in and fixed that for you immediately because we have all the experience, we're troubleshooting this stuff all the time, we can find the problem. And usually in a couple of minutes or sometimes a little bit longer, we can just get the thing fixed and up and working. And if, you're, if you imagine that uh, you had a problem with your car and you went to Toyota and the mechanic just threw you a manual and said, just read chapter six to fix the fuel injection problem in your car. And you go, dude, yep. I'm a school teacher. How, what do I know about fixing that? Uh, right, right, so it, was, right. it always struck me as crazy. And even today, most hosting companies still go with that old school, uh, send you a good knowledge-based article approach. Absolutely. And this is actually, um, this is why I'm an evangelist. I tell everybody, and anytime anybody asks me anything about what I'm doing online and how to do it, <clears throat> I start here. Um, and so I, it's working. So I, I Thank applaud you. you all for that. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, Mark, uh, let's go on with the really difficult questions now. Let's so, do it. Uh, do you think that, did you identify one particular thing that allowed your first company to grow from zero up to, I think, eight figures and then to acquisition? What was the big driver there, do you think? I think, you know, storytelling, extremely important. You know, the things that I'm doing now for Talent Sheets would not have worked for Relio, that was the name of the company, and vice versa. Um, and so we were really good at sales and really good at, at forming partnerships. And with the sales, I think, um, not I think, it was largely storytelling. I tell everybody stats and stories. Those are the two things that are going to get you in a room to actually be remembered and actually have somebody take action. You know, people can't lie with the number or, or can't um, disagree with the numbers. You know, you're, you're telling a story through data. And then the more you can kind of tie that to some kind of analogy or something that's sticky. So we did that a lot. It allowed us, you know, I remember I was <clears throat> coming out of being an actor never having sat on the opposite side of the table of anybody who held the purse strings for any organization and selling us into Estee Lauder and Unilever and uh, Google and Hearst and all these large corporations. Um, and it was because we could sit and paint a compelling story around the data that, that allowed them to say there's a lot of value here, I believe. Okay, interesting. Uh, how many businesses are you currently operating, Mark? How many are there? Yeah, so there's there's talent sheets, and I, which is just to kind of give you the the blurb on it. Talent sheets is still in the influencer marketing space. That's what Relio was initially, um, but we found that um, there were way too many people that couldn't afford our services. You know, our our average ticket price for Relio is twenty five thousand dollars. Our average ticket price for talent sheets is fifteen dollars a month. We have 500 users, and we just try to open that up to the 3 million plus Shopify store owners, the or 4 million plus now, um, the 600,000 people on LinkedIn who have uh, influencer titles. And essentially, it is uh, a SaaS platform that layers into your Google um, Drive, turns your Google Drive into your own uh, CRM. Um, so there's that one. And then there's 30 days to 100K, but which is not really a business so much as uh, kind of a pet project. Uh, it just allows me to kind of scratch this itch. I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs in the way that you're speaking with me right now. And I'm going through and I'm condensing all of these into articles and talking about ways to build a business, opportunities to start something on the side, opportunities to grow. Um, so there's those two. And then I, I have a consultancy as well. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting because, uh, well, my consultancy is just based upon having a successful start and exit. And I've started multiple companies over the years. Um, and it, I work with um, about a dozen, give or take, depending on how the month startups and helping them kind of grow through their, their sales process. Um, but I, I love all this stuff because, you know, it's like a lot of people tell you, you have to focus, you have to say, okay, pick one and go down the road. But I think it's the same thing as, um, you know, it's like you having an interest in, uh, your foundation, right. Uh, to ensure that dogs are not treated 
inhumanely or unjustly and that there's there's money and resources going towards that uh i have a friend a colleague former former um uh client rob schutz who used to be at barkbox barkbox was a client of ours and he's now uh one of the founders of row you know which is a seven billion dollar company and he has a a web uh a website flipping company on the side or you look at darvis shah who is the the co-founder of HubSpot. And he goes and he's built like six things on the side. And so for me, it allows me to kind of create that, to scratch those itches that I get otherwise um, and to learn things that I wouldn't get to learn if I was really using that time to focus on the core business. Because as you're moving things around or as you're growing something, you can't really move things around too much. And so you're trying to figure out what works and so it just allows you to have that freedom to create back to your point about creation and what works and as an entrepreneur what you get excited about uh and actually the scottish seo craig campbell was vis- was visiting sophia today we had lunch and he just left the office a little bit before this interview and we were talking about how uh all of the tools that you need now to get your own project or organization or business off the ground online now it it is a so many are free or cost so little. Uh, it's not like, you know, 40 years ago, you have to buy, you have to get a huge business loan and rent a shop that's going to be a that's cafe right. or whatever, hire staff, get an accountant and all this stuff. It's so risky and, and you know, the cost is so high. And now you can, uh, you know, almost for nothing, you could start some kind of side business project. It's kind of a golden age. Uh, I think yeah, we're in absolutely. now, if, if people recognize that and take advantage of that. Yeah, I think the barrier to entry has never been lower and the opportunity cost of, of not starting has never been higher. You know? Yeah. And when you look at the biggest companies in the world, they're using exactly the same tools and marketing approach as some grandmother down the street who's trying to sell sewing right. patterns or right. something like that. That's right. uh, it, it, everybody has access to those now, which is great. So, Mark, uh, for you looking ahead, what does the road to financial freedom look like? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I feel like I'm personally in, in good position because I've been fortunate. I don't have to not work. I'll always be working. Uh, and I think financial freedom, though, th- the path to it is, is more about, you know, saving more than you earn, um, I think, or, or, or saving more than you spend, not more than you earn. I don't think that's possible. Uh, saving more than you spend. Um, and then looking for ways to stack your revenue streams, right? This is, um, you know, we looked at 300,000 plus layoffs this year alone and people that don't have something on the side or don't have something that they're building are kind of, they're stuck and they're searching for the next thing and they're competing with everybody else. So I think those are the two core areas or two core opportunities. Um, and yeah, for me, I, it's just financial freedom. What does it look like for me in the future? What does it look like for me now? It's just having optionality, just having the opportunity to say, I can do what I want when I want to do it. I can work on the products that I want to work on. I can take the time off if I need to. And that to me is, is the perfect kind of financial freedom scenario for anybody. Great. Uh, and I'm going to go a bit off script here, Mark, which That's I good. did warn you about earlier. And here we I, go, I, man. I, I, I told you. it to the right or left. Perfect. I, I warned you. Uh, and I'm going to share mine in a minute. And if this is too personal, it's completely fine to That's say it. no comment on that at this time. Uh, do you have a longer term financial legacy impact thing that you want to do with your money, with your life, with your existence, if you like? Uh, I do. You know, the so I grew up, I wouldn't say poor, but lower middle class, maybe like I grew up in a trailer in the middle of the woods in Kentucky. Um, uh, and my father worked in a factory for 30 plus years. Uh, my mom was a part-time school teacher. Um, and I think about making sure number one, just like my family security, you know, not, not just, um, uh, I'm in a fantastic place in my life right now. I'm getting married next year. Um, Congratulations. I, um thank you. Uh, and I want to make sure that, you know, she and, and our future children have, you know, just, um, uh, uh, stability. Um, I also think about my family, but the biggest thing that I'm thinking about is, is how can I help people to 
help themselves, you know, and, and, I, and I, I know that that sounds, I don't know, cliche and terrible, but um, there's so many people in the U.S. specifically that I think about are like kind of tied to mountains of debt and they're tied to uncertainty and they don't know how to start. They don't know what to do next. And, and I'm just thinking of people that I know in my life. Um, and so I really want to provide them the proper tools and education and understanding to say, <clears throat> again, the barrier to entry has never been lower. The opportunity and the cost of not starting something has never been higher. And it's a lot simpler to do something than you think. I, I put something um, online the other day about the fact that, you know, you're, you're, if you're an employee, you get about a 3% annual raise, you know, and the median income of the U.S. And I know our audience is global here, but median income in the U.S. or household income, rather, is $70,000 a year. That's split between people. But if you give that to one person, a 3% increase in your salary is, you know, going from 34 to $35 per hour the next year. But if you build something that, that allows you to make an extra $1,000 a month on the side, that's not a massive amount of money, but it's life-changing when you think about that because it's a 17% increase in your, your salary on a, on a 70K household income. And so the thing that I think about, the things that I want to do, the thing that I want to build is, is proper education and opportunity for people to go and start and build something on their own. I, I stand behind it. I, I think it is the best thing that anybody can do for themselves, even if it doesn't unlock everything, their financial freedom for the rest of their lives. It, it, it opens up so much creativity and understanding and learning. Um, uh, so I, I just, I, this, I love it. It's my mission for everything. Great. Two quick thoughts on that. Uh, something that I came to in my own journey as a teacher is that uh, to be a successful teacher, it's all about um, when you work with a student or have finished working with a student, they can now realistically, and this is the key word here, realistically visualize participating in more options in life than they could before they met you. Mm -hmm. So governments can build all the giant schools and fancy buildings and whatever you want. If you don't change up here in the mind of the student, it's all absolutely for nothing. That's right. So, uh, I came from a pretty blue collar background. My father fixed roofs and his father fixed roofs. My brother did the same. And the idea of travel was going every year like 50 miles away. Uh, and the idea of going to university is something that only people on other planets really do. That's definitely not something that we do in this world. And it actually took me a hugely long time to break that programming. So I think if you are a teacher and you achieve that, you've done a great job. Uh, you know getting your, your students just to see a bigger world that they can actually realistically visualize participating in. I think that's, that's the big achievement in teaching. For me personally, uh, my financial mission is uh, to basically uh, build WPX up quite a bit bigger and I have a few other little digital projects as well in order that after I'm gone and pass away, my dog foundation will continue to function basically forever. Yeah. So the mission is that uh, the, day, the day after I pass away, everything will continue exactly as it did the day before. And very few charities and foundations outlive their founder, but that's my primary goal financially. And you see it in charities like the National Trust in Britain, which saves these beautiful old buildings that were started by three ladies at the end of the 1800s. Uh, obviously, they're dead now. Uh, but that charity is bigger than ever. It's a huge part of life in the UK. And they've saved literally hundreds of these beautiful old buildings there. Uh, and there are so many things that are broken in the world that need fixing, you know, whether it's environment or things with orphans or disabled people. Uh, animals, whatever it might be. So there's plenty of choice around. And I think if people uh, sample those and just find the one that really connects with them and gets the fire going. And for us in the foundation, it's, it's not about change. It's about permanent change, permanently mm -hmm. fixing a particular problem. And that's what we're working on here. Yeah, I, I love that because I think, I think that's, everybody wants to have some kind of legacy, I believe. Um, but oftentimes they, they place it in the wrong areas. So I love the idea, and I've, I've not heard anybody frame it this way before, but I love the idea of nothing changes the day after I pass. Um, 
so I, I love that. And I truly hope that it continues that way because it sounds like it's a fantastic cause. Yeah. There's plenty of work to do. It's pretty challenging, I can, I can tell you. I'm sure. Now, Mark, which uh, entrepreneur story really connected with you, you found the most inspiring and got the fire in the belly going the most? Yeah, I, you know, interestingly, like this is what I was saying earlier, I, I'm an accidental entrepreneur. Um, I didn't grow up, you know, reading, you know, um, any of the copy books. I wasn't l- looking at uh, Gary Halpert and his copy writing techniques. I wasn't early in the, in the um, online game and building SEO and having the successes that you've had there and kind of understanding this world. Um, and so then I also wasn't going through and I wasn't looking at like who's building these companies. Um, that was just not the world that I came from. And it's not the world that I transitioned into when I went into mingle to be an actor, just there were two separate areas. And so for me, it wasn't more, it wasn't so much that I heard a story that kind of compelled me to do this. It was that my brother tricked me is what I tell everybody. He tricked me into starting a company with him he said, you can do your, you can still have your life, um, which, uh, was the best thing that ever happened to me, but also false. Um, but as I was going out and I was selling and I was talking to people, I was meeting with all of these founders. You know, I was like, it's like Heidi Zack of Third Love and Andy Katz Mayfield of Harry's. And then we're bringing on Nature Box and Zazzle and Squarespace and Warby Parker and, and Dashlane. And, and you talk to all of these companies and they're all, you know, our age, these founders, and they're building these massive operations that actually have impact. And so it wasn't any singular story. It wasn't any anybody came in and I was like, ooh, I'm really inspired by this. But it was having all of these meetings that I was fortunate enough to get pulled into that allowed me to look at this and say, oh, man, your story is amazing. Your story is amazing. I can't believe you all built this. This didn't exist six months ago. This didn't exist a year ago. Um, and that was that was more the, the catalyst for me to look at this and say, oh, I really want to continue down this path because I didn't think of myself as an entrepreneur at first. I thought of myself as just a guy who was helping his brother start something. And then all of a sudden it was like, wait a second, all of these people are doing this and I'm involved in this today. I want to be involved in the next thing tomorrow or the next thing tomorrow. And this kind of, I, I, it was a massive shift for me having that experience and, and chatting with other founders more so than with the list. Nice. What does success or change look like to you, Mark? What's, what's the metric that you use for the success of something? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I think that the, the question has is there's, there's a specific business success. There is a specific business outcome, you know, and then there's personal success. And so, you know, if, uh, setting my goals for my businesses and then hitting those goals successful in my eyes, right? On a personal level, I feel like uh, by every standard, I'm I'm successful. Like I have a family that I love. I'm very close to my family. Um, A lot of of people don't have that. They do not. You know, I, I, I didn't grow up with the financial means of a lot of people, but I grew up with, uh, a family that like continue to just say, you know, we trust you to, to pursue whatever you want to pursue. We're going to be behind you. So many people don't have that. I'm, I'm, beyond uh, grateful and fortunate and lucky in all these scenarios. Um, so I have a very close family. I'm in a relationship that I'm very happy. Uh, I, you know, I split time between New York city and here. I'm upstate New York. Uh, there's a lake right out back. I like, I, so on a, on a quote unquote successful measure, anybody looking in would say, Oh great. He's successful. I, you know, like I get to choose the things that I want to work on. Um, I think though it's like it's it is optionality getting to choose the things you want to work on, but also contentment, right? Because I think people can look at me and say, "Oh, he has X, Y, Z, and that makes, and therefore he's successful." And I can look at somebody else and say, "Oh, well, they have A, B, C, and I don't. Therefore, they're successful." And they can look at somebody else and it just keeps down that path. But I think just being content with what you have. Um, is where true success actually lies, where you're able to say, I don't need to chase. I can chase if I want, to, but I don't need to. Um, that That's success for me. Yeah, comparing is extremely destructive and doesn't help. It sure is. 
And the, the thing what I think you're getting at here, and I know this is a bit of a self-help cliche, but is gratitude. Absolutely. Uh, at gratitude. And I think in this age of hate and division and rage that we kind of uh, have, have find ourselves in now, gratitude is a wonderful antidote to that. And it's a very positive approach, feeling mindset to have, one of gratitude. Yeah, 100%. I'll listen. What about you? Let me around because yep. you normally ask people this. What does it mean for you? Just since since I've got you. Uh, so I don't care at all about personal fame or whatever. And after I'm gone, it doesn't matter who knows my name or anything. But the impact that I want to have is to permanently transform the treatment of dogs, not just in Eastern Europe, but actually in the world, which sounds so pretty, like pretty lofty. Um, I also have a professional writing background, so I was a writer in advertising in Sydney for quite a while. Uh, and for a while I've been working on a book about, and it's called Why Dogs Matter. And it sort of traces the uh, ancestral connection that we have to dogs when we lived in caves, when dogs slept with us, they hunted with us, they protected us. And we, because evolution is actually quite slow, we still have all of those instinctive feelings positively towards dogs and right. they also have the same to us um, and we kind of live in, i'm giving you the very brief summary of a more complicated text here of course but i think we live in an age now of tremendous uh, tremendous kind of social isolation and loneliness yes. and you look at all the the societal metrics on things like suicide self-harm uh, all of these things are trending very heavily in the wrong direction Agreed. And actually, I think animals can be a big part of the solution to that if we, they're kind of hiding in plain sight, but we think we're going to find happiness in the number of likes on social media or whatever, not in necessarily in a relationship with a horse or a dog or a cat or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's, the book is kind of about that. And the thing that I'm trying to do with our shelter, which we call a sanctuary, we prefer to call it that because shelters have such a negative association. Right, right. To present kind of a living prototype so that any uh, personal organization anywhere in the world can copy what we've done, look at the mistakes, uh, but also look at our blueprint of what we've figured out and doing well because this whole, what is called no cage, open yard philosophy yeah. is tremendously Contest. positive for the dogs. And what it does is it makes them much more adoptable Almost all of them are ready to go into a loving home. And when you put dogs in a tiny cell in a shelter, even in Australia, where I'm from, they'll build a big expensive facility, but the, the cells are tiny for dogs. This takes away everything a dog needs and often uh, gives them kind of permanent behavioral problems. Yeah. So I want to very much disrupt the old model of dog shelters. I want to... Uh, try to make some impact on the cultural habit of buying breed dogs, not shelter, getting a shelter or rescue dogs. Um, and generally just raising the status of dogs much more and trying to improve our relationship with them. Yeah. So that for me would be some, any level of success on that stuff would be, would be successful. Ah, I love it. I love it. It's still so interesting. And, and I love my dog. She is, uh, we're one of those weird dog parents, she's our daughter, you know, like, so to speak, um, shelter dog. And, uh, man, I, I love this. I, I can't wait to see the book. So you have to keep me posted on when it comes out. Absolutely. Yeah, it'll be very reasonably priced as well, Mark. I've got two follow-up spin-off questions, Mark. These are the toughies. So are you still performing? Are you still doing any acting, singing, performing? I'm not, you know, uh, acting for me was much more about the creativity. Uh, I miss it. I don't miss the, the lows, uh, but I get to create every single day when I'm building something online, which is a lot of fun. I think you, you should consider doing drama workshops with kids in your area. You'd probably enjoy it a lot. I probably just would. A, just a volunteer project. I probably would. That's probably a good call. Yep. If it's not if, but when Netflix makes a movie about your life, which actor will play you? <sighs> See, I'd like to believe it's Bradley Cooper. Um, my fiance would tell me that it is Jonah uh, Hill. <laughs> somebody similar, yeah, basically. So there I'm we judged. go. Bradley Cooper. Yeah, I'd like to believe it'd be Bradley Cooper. My fiance would tell me that it's Paul Giamatti. 
Okay, fair enough, nice. Mark, it's been a great pleasure today. I always love catching up with other entrepreneurs, even accidental ones. I'll so uh, please stay in touch. I'll let you know about the book, which would be at least a couple of years away. But actually you can follow our foundation's Facebook page and just see the stories of what we're doing and growing it and helping more dogs and all of that. I will absolutely do that. And Terry, thank you so much for having me on. Uh, this was awesome. And I'm a loyal customer, but I hope that we stay in touch outside of that. So thank you. Me too. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for your time. Right. Have a good day there.